Good afternoon. Yeah, yeah. Good to see everybody. Glad you're here with us. This is part of our continuing series. Oh, maybe something's coming in. Sorry. Yeah. yeah. Um, this is part of our continuing series of Wind Park Library. It's a two-fold series. Always occurs on the second Saturday of the month. Um, as I've told a few of you, we have made, they have asked, and so we agreed to extend this for next year. So it's very exciting. Um, this year, and we'll do this again next year on once one of the months. I think the this is August, right? So this is this September. So the even the odd numbered months, starting in January, were past weeks present, where we're just talking about different historical topics. We cover a variety of things, and next year we've got a friend comes and will speak on NASA and space race, some other different topics, just random. Um, welcome, welcome, welcome. Come on in. And then on even months. Um, we spend our time talking about some of the library aspects to plan for called Citizen Cities. So we're trying to look at what what does what is the, the United States civic structure. So we're trying to look at that. This year we spent most of that time talking about the Constitution itself. Um, I think next year we're actually going to kind of move it more into not History 101, American History 101, but maybe some seminal questions. We're still working on that. Today, we're looking at my favorite of the founders. So uh, again, cards on the table, right? So there's no, you know, no hiding that part of it, uh, John Adams. Um, I recently was, um, now this has been uh, a couple years ago, but was uh, given three books that are um, by a certain series that has some of his writings. His writings are actually much more massive. And he and Abigail were prolific in their writing. And um, so as I'm reading them, I'm just enjoying more of the actual man's words. And so most of this series, come on in, come on in. You know, you're fine. Most of this, what I'm gonna show you today, will be his words. You will actually read his quotes, and I, I don't usually read from the slides, but I will read from the slide to get his voice um, in there. But as I was reading, I was just struck by something that I think I knew, but illuminated for me, which is how deep and thoughtful he was in regards to good governance. Like I just mentioned the citizen civics aspect, right? Now that doesn't make him right, so just please know, giving all the ahead of time, just kind of right. So I love him, he's my favorite. Um, so then I think of him as right. But as a good historian, he may not be, right? And he may have positions that you think, no, that's terrible, I don't agree with that at all. And you are certainly allowed to, in fact, if you feel that way, you should feel that way, you know, feel, feel strong in that. So we're not saying, I'm not saying, John Adams said it, Eric, that's what we should do. There are going to be a couple of quirky things that you're going to see that he lays out that we didn't do, and I don't think it would have worked the way he lays it out. Um, and there's places where, as you'll see, he was, he was um, he becomes, in my opinion, of the early founders, uh, the most misunderstood. Um, Hamilton's coming back to town, um, it, it, the play, the musical. And because Hamilton hated Adams, and Adams returned the favor, um, he is only mentioned at a very, very brief moment in the play. Actually, he's mentioned twice. In both times, it's with derision. Now, that's, that was Lin-Manuel's decision, but it's based off the author that he was working with um, and who produced the Hamilton story, right? And I only mention that, not to say anything about the play or about Hamilton himself, but just to understand that Adams was uh, deeply loved by a few and deeply hated by a few. I mean, he wasn't the kind of person who kind of people felt were good. Hey, come on in. Felt were comfortable. Or they could kind of get along. Or we slightly disagree. No, no, no. John is the kind of person. He's, he's tough. Tough to, to either agree with him or don't. And, and part of that was because of his mannerism. He was um, trained as a lawyer. I'm going to go for a second. And he was combative. Um, he loved to argue. He loved to discuss. Which, particularly if you're on the other side of it, sounds like an argument, right? And for him, like the best thing was a deep debate of whatever. And he was comfortable, if it came to it, in losing. But he wanted to lose because you won the argument through evidence and logic. That makes sense. But he, he had no problem going out the road. For someone like Jefferson, Jefferson's the kind of person who hated to argue. He was the kind of person who wanted to always be a sphinx. You didn't know what he was thinking. He wanted to connive things. You knew Jefferson, when Adams was moving the pieces of the, of the puzzle, of the, of the chessboard. Jefferson, total opposite. 
Um, and, and not trying to pick on Jefferson, you may be someone who just doesn't like being in those kind of discussions at, at a dinner table or with friends or whatever. And even if it's something casual, like is the new Lord of the Rings thing on Amazon good or not good? Right? And they somebody's really strong opinion, you just kind of maybe go, yeah, I'm not getting into that conversation, even if you have a strong opinion. So John was somebody who liked to do that. And so then that turns people. And he said at one point, you know, to Jefferson, my problem is I talk too much. I just can't shut up. I think that's another reason why I like John, because when I, I just, I've said a couple times, I, I was just at a conference. And in my head, I have to constantly be saying, don't say anything, just don't say anything. They don't need to hear you. You've already said one thing. So I, I'm telling myself this because I like I have strong opinions and I like to express them and I think I sometimes can express them well. So I, I resonate uh, with that. Um, so looking at his writings, though, illuminated for me the sense of wow, he did have this very very sharp mind about governance. Now many people, particularly Jeffersonians. And there's a lot of stories that are Jeffersonians, although you won't find a modern biography of Jefferson because he, he's too toxic to write about. Because there's nothing good to say. There's been a, good, there's been a new Je uh, Jeffersonian biography for a long time. And I, again, cards on the table, some of you know this, I despise Jefferson. If we could tear down the Jefferson Memorial, I would do it tomorrow. So feel free, if you, online, you want to hate me for that, you, you may deeply can disagree with me. I totally respect that um, for lots of reasons. Um, but, um, Jeffersonians will say James Madison was the greatest constitutional mind that we have. He was a brilliant constitutional thinker. I still think he's second to Adams. Um, and it's interesting when you really did, we won't do this today, but if you, if you look at kind of our constitutional thinking and you place Madison here and Adams here, you can begin to see some of the tension that, that, that kind of has permeated through the country. Because of this kind of you know, differing views, one historian said it this way, Madison thought about um, horizontal relationship, and he talked a lot about how will we do what we're trying to do over the scope of a continent. And Adams thinks vertically, trying to think in the terms of how within the system, how does it work with power, positions of power, and issues. That, that could be a good way to think about it. Um, so anyway, Today what we're doing as part of Passing Presence is just trying to understand what did John say? Like him, don't like him, agree, don't agree. What did he say? And this comes out of the reading of his own words uh, through his life, letters, diaries, documents. That we're going to look a lot at three major documents that he produced on governance. Um, as you may know, he was in Paris. Um, actually, he was in London at this point. But he and Jefferson were not at the Constitutional Convention. It's one of the great kind of like anomalies or markers of our government. Um, is that these two people that we typically laud at this kind of pinnacle or, you know, him, Franklin, Washington, with the, arguably the greatest constitutional mind and perhaps the greatest speaker <coughs> philosophically, right, about liberty, though he didn't actually do it in function, um, <coughs> you know, we're not there. So they respond to what they read. They're sent letters. Madison's consistently writing to Jefferson. Others are writing, you know, to both of them. So they're getting letters, you know, in arrears, you know, five weeks, eight weeks, 12 weeks. Um, and so they're just, what do I think about this? And then it's interesting that the two of them, Jefferson and Adams, we have conversations. And we, turn, we don't know about them, really. We just know snippets. It would be great to have been there with them, fly on the wall kind of a thing, to get, like, what, as they're reading and what are they thinking kind of thing. So, here we go. So just get background of who he was, right? So he was born in Massachusetts, um, born to a fairly uh, poor family. Um, not, not excessively poor, um, but not famous. And this will be important for you to keep in your mind locked in. We're gonna, we're gonna be talking a lot about elite, and he's gonna use the word aristocracy. We're gonna come back and explain that later, so I'm just gonna leave it hanging there, all right? But, but he would be the epitome of not elite. His family, his background. Okay, he gets to go to Harvard on the strength of his brain and studies for law and will pursue a law practice. This becomes obviously important in thinking. He didn't have to be a governance thinking person, but nonetheless, he was somebody who thought in kind of legal structure kind of ways. So that's kind of his mindset. And then in 64, you can see that he marries Abigail. 
Um, prior to that, in 61, he's working in the, in the Bostonian system, right? So he's, he's around Boston. And so it is around Boston then that we know the real churn of the revolution, our journey to revolution begins. Sorry for the Virginians, who of course would like to make this the United States of Virginia. That's their view. The whole country is based with Jamestown. We were here first. Roman up called um, The revolution really does start in Boston. Virginia is critical, and they have their own issues that come out of the events, but it's really in Boston where the truth begins to percolate. And so it's not surprising that for a young man entering into the adult world, and he's hitting his very early 20s, at the moment when this kind of seminal great crisis moment. I think some of you have been here in years past, we've talked about, uh, I'm someone who's supportive of the Great Cycle series that the American, Anglo-American history is on a, a 500 year-ish cycle. Um, and you know, I, I wrote a book in 2011 saying, hey, we'll know for sure if it's gonna happen by 2020. So I wrote it in 2011, not because I'm prophetic, but I can do math and, and, and I believe in the system and 2020. Right? And so we're in that same crisis, right? So I work with young people all the time. I'm really privileged to, to, to work with them. If one of them becomes a, a great champion in our national history over justice, about governance, about economic equity, future historians will not be surprised. Right? Why did that happen for that person? Well, they'll look back and say, oh, well, you know, they, were, they were 20 when all this stuff happened in this window of time that we're in, and it's not just Mr. Trump, it's not just coronavirus, it's kind of this window of uh, our 20 year winter, which we go through every 80 years. So John's in that same boat. That winter is the revolutionary period. Our great crisis at that time, building over the 80 years, landed there. So the previous one was the glorious revolution, God save the king. Um, so, you know, it's apropos, we're kind of talking about this stuff because it was in the moment when we chose not to be part of the system. And as you know, we're not even in the Commonwealth, which we could be, but I don't think we ever will be. Um, so, you know, there's this whole thing happening for this the American citizens that ends in the 1680s, the bloodless revolution, the glorious revolution. And then you go forward another 80 years and you get to the 1760s and we go again. So, so, this kind of thing. So, so this is kind of his view. And because of it, he was constantly thinking not only about like how do we win, but what do we do next? In other words, if you're saying, and she may be saying this today, if you said our constitution is flawed, not even flawed, our constitution's wrong. Might have been good then, we're in like year 240 something, but today we should we should kill it before we get to 250. If you thought that. You're allowed. You're allowed to think that. But then if you were thinking that. I hope then you have the good sense to be thinking, what would you replace it with? What's your plan? Right? So if you think we should be getting rid of this thing and you plan to make your next 10 years, like John's, consistently in the story of we have to stop this thing, this US Constitution, and Electoral College, and a president, this we have to stop, that's terrible, we need to stop it. Okay, great. But then you should be hopefully thinking then, what do you want to replace it with? And John was somebody who was. He was deeply conscious of, we need to replace it with stuff. And he gets into it really, really early, right? So in 1761, before he marries Abigail, he's in Boston, and already the revolution's beginning. Now, I will teach my students in my American history class, we start with 1763, with the proclamation line as the beginning, coming after the end of the French and Indian War. It's kind of where we start the quote-unquote road to the revolution. But... John would disagree with me. He said, no, 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 no. And he said, the year 1776, I've hitherto considered as the commencement of the controversy. And for him, the controversy begins in Boston between some of the powerful political families led by James Otis Jr. and the people who supported the crown. Now, I'm going to hesitate, or I mean, I hasten to say, as I've said many times before, the American Revolution is a civil war. We win, so we get to write the history. So we get to sweeten it. It was a revolution. And for many Americans, then they hear that as we were like our own country, minding our own business, and then this other evil country, led by a king, tried to ruin it for us. They came and just like started passing laws they had no right to pass, threatening us with stuff and doing things. I would say 80% of Americans I talk to, that's their mindset. And if that were true, 
then you could go down a certain road. But as a historian, we should have no opinion to the matter. We don't, we don't have an opinion. Just what does the evidence tell us? And so what we know is British citizens living in North America got frustrated with how some things went that were done by the British government in the British capital, which happened to be on the other side of the ocean. And they begin raising those questions that we're unhappy with. So you have a British citizen who's saying, hey, I'm unhappy with decisions that are being made by the government. And you have other British citizens, Bernard and Hutchinson, Hutchinson becomes really important, who are saying, nope, I think these are good decisions. And hopefully just in that you go, that sounds very familiar. Should we have a national health care plan? Should we not have a national health care plan? Should we have abortion? Should we not have abortion? Should we have mass mandate? Should we not have mass mandates? Am I happy with the government? Am I not happy with the government? That's the same debate that we're in today, in, in my opinion at least. Um, and if you can back up from the immediacy of a specific topic, you go, oh my gosh, yeah, okay. And so American U.S. citizens in 2022 are frustrated with what the government is doing, and U.S. citizens in the year 2022 are happy with what the government is doing. And if you back up to U.S. citizens in 2017, I mean 2017, those two flip as to who's happy and who's not happy. But you can see it's the debate about how do we do it, what do we do? So he, he's a young guy, he's just in this, and he starts his journey of writing, right? He starts thinking about trying to contribute some. And his first foray is with letters written by Humphrey Plowjogger. Now this was a thing that happened all the time. I don't think you could do it today. I mean, I don't think the Sentinel would publish something if you put a false name to it. Uh, they might publish it not knowing better, but if somebody called out, that's not a person, that's Carl Grayson, then I'd probably be banned from ever publishing something. But back then, it was a common thing to do to write letters to the editor with some kind of a name, either a made-up name, or sometimes they would write with, you know, a farmer, you know, a farmer from Pennsylvania, and then they would publish those things. And sometimes we still don't know who some of the people were, but other times we have a pretty good group. So he's writing, saying, hey, I think we should do some different things. Then the Stamp Act comes, the Stamp Act, he gets really involved with this, he starts writing about it. You know, he's young, most of them are young, Patrick Henry, 29 years of age, our young is getting involved uh, in this. Um, that's also an aspect of the great crisis cycle. You typically see um, most of the energy of this is broken or this is wrong or we should change it coming from the younger generations alive at the time and the ones who are comfortable or settled or satisfied in the older. That's not always true, but that's you generalize, kind of see that. Um, and Adams is very, very involved in the process. So there's a decision made for there to be a stand back Congress. Adams is not included, but in Baintree, where he's from, he was asked to write instructions. So write kind of like, what are we mad about and what do we want our representatives to go do? So he does. It's received so well that over 40 other areas in Massachusetts adopted them, published them in their papers. And so the name John Adams starts getting out. So again, you start seeing him start to become somebody who's noted for his thinking in terms of governance, how governments should work. Um, it's interesting, here you can begin to see his thoughts about the judiciary in that he becomes really the first person that I know of who notes his anger or worry is not about taxes or representation, but that what's being proposed is an attack or an imposition about an independent judiciary, which again, English, history, that's a key aspect of, the, of their battle over the 1600s, that is the judiciary independent from the crown, and to some degree from parliament, but certainly from the crown. So he's noting this, and he says, you know, I'm, I'm unhappy with this. The most grievous innovation of all is the alarming extension of power. That doesn't ring as well as no taxation without representation, which, by the way, is inaccurate. We have representation, but we don't have to talk about that. Um, so he's really focused on the judiciary in the process. So this is where we really start getting him thinking. And he, again, you got guys like Sam Adams, Patrick Henry, John Hancock, they're really like verbal philosophical leaders, like charge the gates. And John's not, but he's the one thinking, when we do, what do we do? And I love this right here. Unhappily, a political experiment cannot be made in a laboratory, nor determined in a few hours. The operation, once begun, runs over whole quarters of the globe and is not finished in many thousands of years. What he's saying, if you modernize it, is I'm a gamer, I like playing video games. 
It'd be awesome to be in a video game where we could hit a save state. Let's save it now. And now, let's try this. And then we run it for 70 years. And we go, do we like it? Do we not like it? We're happy, we're not happy. And then as the controller of the game, you can go, cool, this is great, keep going. But if for some reason you're like, yeah, that didn't work out right. You just scrub that, go back to the save state, and start again, and try different. Okay, I did this, that didn't work, we do this instead. All right, does that make sense for everybody? And John's pointing out, that's not the way the real world works. It doesn't work that way. So that's why it is challenging for us. And we're to scrap our constitution. Um, just like when they scrap their constitution, they scrap their constitution when they leave the king, they then write a new constitution, they scrap that one 10 years later. When they scrap these constitutions, it's a huge risk that we've made it work as long as we have is to their credit. And it should be at least a word of warning to us. So in one of the first things he writes that gets us into the view of governance is this dissertation on canon and feudal law. So what John begins to say is in the 1760s, into the 1770s, he feels like the crown is trying to reimpose canon and feudal law. Now this is a mid, Middle Ages thing, right? So canon law, and so in the Middle Ages, when the church was at its highest strength, like in civic life, right? If you did something, there, there was a series of laws of where you lived. And if you broke one of those laws, it would either be that you broke canon law, and I don't mean just like some, you think of what, what a religious thing might be in your head, like maybe cursing, I guess. Or, but there were certain laws that could even be just a, what we would consider like a civic or civil issue, like something could sue you for. And that would still fall into canon law. So you would go to the church judge. You'd be prosecuted in the church court. All the other laws fell under the feudal lord, the nobility, what we would consider normal, secular, you know, kind of stuff. And so John argues in this dissertation on canon and feudal law that, hey, they're trying to reestablish this for us, and that's not good. And so he's arguing that we needed to be alert that the issues of what they were doing were, in his opinion, trying to revert back. Now, I'll just say on the side, when you study the whole story, all the founders and their views about what the crown was doing are largely erroneous. Right? If you, if, again, you put it through, bring all the information out, put it all on the table, like, yeah, they weren't doing what you thought they were doing. There's no evidence for what they did. You read the Declaration, Jefferson and Adams supports him and Franklin, the king's a tyrant. You literally cannot produce the evidence for that viewpoint. Right? We like to say it, but it's completely false. In fact, one of the reasons you could say the British lose the American Revolution for the whole story, so both the philosophical stuff and then the war stuff, is because the king did not act like a tyrant. He didn't say, okay, screw it, I'm taking over. Right? He, did, he, didn't, he didn't start making decisions. He allowed himself, as if you pay attention to anything that King Charles has done in the past you know, 48 hours, I'm bound by the Constitution, I'm bound by the parliamentary leaders. You know, it's one of the concerns people have with Charles is like, will he be stoically quiet like Elizabeth II was, or will he mouth off a little bit? Because we don't want him to, because he's not supposed to. In essence, and so in here you get another one of his first governing concepts that education is vital. If we don't have deep support for education, we're in trouble. And he makes the arguments that you can see here, for instance, that the people were held in ignorance. Um, liberty with her knowledge and virtue too seemed to have deserted the earth. And these three things, liberty, knowledge, and virtue are key kind of touchstones for him. He's going to come back to it again and again and again. You know, so he's arguing that part of what happens to us and what's happening at this point is that the people are being kept ignorant of what the crown is doing. So we need to be alert so that we don't allow us to go down this road of canon and feudal law. Let me stop here real quickly just to say, as I've often tried to say, that some of you may be new, please interrupt me with the question you have. Don't try to think you can remember it an hour and a half later. If you want to write it down, feel free, but it's a give and take kind of thing, so I'm very comfortable if you want to say, wait, I don't understand this. Um, in it, he does begin to kind of bring out both Locke and Hobbes, which are really the kind of philosophical touchstones for our founders, though most will lean to Locke, um, in saying, okay, we have rights that come to us from God. Um, they're not from the government. Um, you know, he said they're derived from the great legislator of the universe. And so 
like we shouldn't be bound by either canon or feudal law in the process. When he writes the fourth installment of this, the stand back has really begun to build in intensity. So then he's urging his readers to go read the Constitution and remember the liberty. So this is, if you're interested in some of the things about our current government, particularly the thing we call the Bill of Rights, um, to understand that conversation and the passion around the Bill of Rights, you have to understand the Glorious Revolution and what we call the British Constitution. Or it's not a constitution. They don't have a written constitution. Um, so it's the Declaration of Rights that King William and, and Queen um, Mary signed in agreement in, in that, that whole process of that. But in there, there's an enumerated list of things that the parliamentary and revolutionary leaders in the 1680s were saying, hey, this is what we're mad. We're mad at King Charles II. Now, he's passed away, but then he kind of set in motion some things, and we're mad at James II. This is why we're revolting. They, they're denying us these things. Right? And the previous Charles, Charles I, lost his head because of the same sort of things in that process. So he's like, there seems to be a direct and formal design on foot to enslave all of America. The first step seems to be an entire subversion of the whole system of English law of liberty. So he's, he's got this reference point, and he's going to use it as his, as his concept of like why we should be in the revolution. Okay. Now, from the stand back, as you know, there is all the events that lead to the actual revolution itself. We, you, you probably know these. If you've been here, some of these we've covered ourselves. Again, John's at the center of these, right? So he's defending Adams, um, I mean, defending Hancock in Admiralty Court. Hancock was a smuggler. From our point of view, he was a capitalist businessman. But from the British system of laws, he was a smuggler. So he gets called in Admiralty Court was an example for John of the breakdown of justice because this was done by a select small group of like British officials, right, or governing officials, right? rather than a court of our peers, which again, in the English Glorious Revolution, that's one of the key things that's in there, is that all law will be um, adjudicated by, in front of a jury of my peers, not determined by a single kind of judge or someone connected to the crown, to the government, right? But he can defend him, um, but he's trying to walk both sides, right? So when the Boston Massacre occurs, you know that's a misnomer, only one of those two words is true, and it did happen in Boston. Um, <laughs> he defends the British shelters, gets them all acquitted except for two who got manslaughter charges, got their thumbs branded and sent, oh, they sent back, it's Colonel Preston off, completely scot free, and brilliant defense, really worth reading into more. But then the Boston Tea Party occurs, the Crown will pass a series of acts that they label the Coercive Acts. Bostonians and soon uh, United States, British citizens will call them the Intolerable Acts. So you can begin to see kind of there's a nomenclature issue. The revolution at one level is a battle over definitions. Was Hancock a smuggler or was he a capitalist? And that's all about definition. It's how you see, see the world. So we're, from the British point of view, we're gonna try to coerce you into obedience from the American point of view, you're being intolerable and over the top in your imposition to our lives. Right? So out of that, as you probably know, came the decision to call for yet another Congress gathering of leaders from the 13 colonies. It all come, I think there was 11. And this time John is chosen to go. So the first Continental Congress, first Continental Congress meets, it's nothing overwhelming about it, much like the Stamp Act Congress, they worked themselves quickly to a conclusion in which they would produce a document. They produce what's called the Declaration and Resolves. It's a letter they sent to the king saying, hey, fix this for us. And then they say, we will disband and come back in the spring to see what the king's response is. Right? The king does not respond. And between those times, you have other events happening in Boston which then will lead them to re-enter into Philadelphia, into what we call Independence Hall today, and start the Second Continental Congress, which they will not disband until we have a new government in the 1780s. All right, so that will be the government, the acting government, the process. While they're away from that moment, 
you get another sense where Adams begins to really lay out some governing principles. He engages in a long spirited debate under the name of Novogelus. And he's writing against, I'm not going to try, Massachusetts tennis. And to this day, we don't know who this is. We think it's Daniel Leonard. Adams was convinced it was his friend, a former close friend, Jonathan Sewell. Some linguists, historians, scholars believe there's a mixture of the two, and we could be completely wrong, and there could be a third person who we still have not identified. We're not sure. But in them, they're kind of going down. It's a fascinating reading. If you want to take time to read this debate, it's very long, it's very wordy. I mean, they, they, they would not have made the word count for the Sentinel um, or any other modern newspaper. That maybe, maybe the journal, I suppose. Um, and then back and forth on the process. And so this is really interesting because Adams now starts to openly argue our only solution is independence. Previously, he was not, he was more to some degree a moderate, but now he's pushing down this road. And so you can see he says here the difference of the tax upon us for the good of the empire. We submit to this cheerfully, but insist that we ought to have credit for it. Meaning what he's arguing about is that the crown is not indicating that they recognize the contribution of the citizens who are over here. And that seems for Adams to suggest there's maybe a dismissiveness from the crown, and therefore we should perhaps kind of go our own way. And so now he starts building this logic that we should govern ourselves. What year was that? Uh, this is in 74. Okay. If Parliament has a right to tax us and legislate for us in all cases, then the destruction of the tea was unjustifiable. But the people of America are right in their principle that Parliament has no such right. And if you read the rest of his document, that's really, he starts going down this road of does Parliament have this right of governance over the totality of the lands? Right, so it's, it's a debatable thing. The Parliament has no such right. That the act of Parliament is null and void, and it is lawful to oppose and resist it. The question then is whether the destruction of tea was necessary. He will end up saying the destruction of tea was absolutely necessary, and we needed to take this step. Um, this is a pretty substantial transformation for Adams. Now, out in front, he, he's, his writing is known in England. Uh, later when the war comes, he'll be on the short list of the Howe brothers of who to execute. Uh, everybody else, there's pardons for most names, um, but Adams is on the short list. We're capturing this dude, he's going down. Um, because he was so well, he was more well known than Washington. Washington will become better known in England to English citizens. Um, but even at that point, they will see Washington in some degree kind of a, in a noble, like a noble warrior fighting for what was right, even if I disagree with what he was right, and then he succeeded, so we owe him laud, right? And Adams will be seen as this provocateur, this argumentative, troublesome person that they're unhappy with. Um, it'll, when Adams is our first ambassador to England, this will be problematic, because he and Abigail will struggle to fit into society because so many people there do not like him. And they and you know, sometimes you know again he's tough to get you get your head wrapped around. So the war actually comes in essence because the king declares war, Parliament declares war through what was called the um, the uh, he lays it out here in August in this in the speech basically we're gonna go at it and it's a it's a prohibition on our training. So he basically tells the Royal Navy to go and capture any American ships that are on the high sea and, and take them. So to the, it looked like a war to them. So we're trying to, we're to skip on past this part. The Prohibitory Act comes in it's February. And so from February of 76 through July, even though there still was a, they're not really loyalist, but an anti-war, ergo anti-revolution faction in Philadelphia. As we talked about here many times before, the declaration was not a slam dunk. Um, it's, it's a battle back and forth. There are three states, really four, to count the abstention of New York, who, who are against, the, the, against it. So they're kind of moving. In fact, you can read some letters between Adams and Abigail where she'll be saying, even before February, why aren't we declaring independence? And you're like, I got 
trying, they're trying. These people, they're very slow. And there are people who just did not want to go there for a variety of different reasons, some out of loyalty, some out of fear. So they're trying to get their way through. But after the Prohibitory Act, and of course, as you know, this is after Common Sense has been published in January, right? So after that, momentum begins to build. And so at this point, there work to a May Declaration in which the Congress in Philadelphia says to each of the colonies, declare yourself independent. Well, that means they need to write their governments. Now, they had colonial charters that had government structures within it, but now all 13, at some level, begin thinking, well, we need to write a document of governance. So at this moment, Richard Stockton, or no, no, not Stockton, hang on a second, it's this guy here, William Hooper. I'll come back to that. I'll come back to that. Well, I'll just keep it. William Hooper says to John, I would like it if you wrote down some concepts of governance so I could use that in North Carolina. He'd send these to North Carolina because we're gonna begin the process of writing a government. So he does, he writes thoughts on government. Some other representatives found out about it and said, I wanna come do that. And eventually his friend, uh, Richard Henry Lee, um, just publishes it and starts handing it out. So thoughts on government is really the first kind of organized description of what we could possibly do instead by any American. So there are a lot of writings from a lot of people about the complaints, unhappinesses, you know, frustrations. Again, as he said to Abigail about Payne, Payne's writing is great about tearing down and destroying, but he's got nothing about building. So we got to build. Now, Payne and Payne supporters would disagree with that, just so you know. I agree with that, but I'm just defending Payne for a second. Payne was like, I'm about it. I got some good ideas. Uh, so he begins kind of writing. And just to come back to this just for a second, John will become the leading advocate. And you can see some of the comments here by these people who really see him as the leader of the country. I mean, if you were had a vote for president, if they'd known the idea of a president, John would have won, hands down. It would have just been a slam dunk at that point. Um, because he was erudite, um, persuasive, argumentative, defending the position, having come to the conclusion, like with his, you say, legal mind, that we're in the right for our decision to go for independence, he could, he could win that debate. You may have heard people talk about, well, let's have this in the arena of ideas, right? Like in our modern day, bring your idea. And it seems like a lot of times people don't want to do that for one reason or another. John would have been out there like a gladiator. Oh, come on, what you got? Bring it to me. Let's go. He was eager to have that conversation. So, so they are thinking, hey, hey, what's this? Um, yeah, how do we do the government? So, what is he write? Government is nothing more than the combined force of society for the peace, order, safety, good, and happiness of the people. Now, what does he mean by combined force? Well, what he's saying here is combined force, and it's going to be kind of the core for his thinking, is that you have to have a mechanism by which every aspect of society can contribute to the government. This is where he's going to get in trouble with a lot of people. Yeah, I'll show you in a second. The government must be planned. This is his enlightenment bent coming out with a lot of enlightenment thinker, thinkers that you can think in a kind of rational kind of way and organize like he would talk about like a clockmaker. It's like a clockmaker could build something, a craftsman person could build something. He was openly, and this is the last, the last part of the session today, a little bit, we'll talk about this, he was openly aware of the problems. So as much as he says, hey, look, this is what we should do, he also says, here's where we're going to screw it up. So he, these are the things to be warning. In fact, I find his writings on warnings far more present for us today, um, whereby if we really were thinking, something's gone wrong, which I think a lot of us maybe sort of think, you go back and read Adams, I think you just go, oh, yes, yes, that's the answer. And so we can work from there from a perspective. He's kind of like our doctor. And he is adamant that the structure must be what he calls mixed. All right, so this idea of a mixture of government, what is he talking about? Mixture of government, right? For him, it comes down to understanding that historically, government has fallen into one of three categories. 
The whole power of society lies in the hands of the whole society, the rule of the many, called the democracy. Now that's really only happened in Athens. The few other places you might could say were sort of there, the Venetians would maybe sort of claim there, but I would argue only in Athens. But at this point, in you know, late 1700s, there are a lot of people who are saying, this is the answer that we need. Or power placed in the hands of a few great, rich, wise men, that government is an aristocracy, the role of the few. So that would be what most people consider the Middle Ages to be, particularly in the high Middle Ages before you get anywhere close to kingdoms or proto, you know, early nations, right? You would have people in those days calling themselves king, but they, they, they had not much more power than the earl, you know, 100 miles away, right? So you have the sense of the aristocracy or absolute power of the community entrusted to a single person, the government is called a monarchy or the rule of the one. So for Adams, we have to find a way to mix these things. We can't find a way to exclude any part. And efforts to exclude a part for Adams will fail. So you have to have all three parts embedded in the system. And for Adams, the Roman version of what we would call a government of the people is the one closest to this. Now he doesn't say we should just do theirs, because if you know the Roman version of the Republic, they had two people as the executive, and he didn't think that was a smart plan, because they would argue with each other and that could be problematic. And their Senate was Senate for life. So he didn't think we should have Senate for life. He didn't think that kind of a thing. But that's kind of where he's going. The Republic is the best form of government. Why? This is back to his kind of leading through his background. A Republic is an empire of laws and not of men, not of humans. Right? And so he writes elsewhere in another time that a government, and I don't have this up here, is one where all people, the first, meaning like Washington, the last, the poorest, right? The rich, the poor, the educated, the uneducated are all equally subject to the law. There should not be a system in which anybody has any way to circumvent the law. Privilege, Privilege power, wealth, and these are things he's going to talk about. I mean, for me, whenever I read that sentence, I'm like, yep, that's a problem for us. Um, so leave there, plenty of current things work that may show up and stuff. But that will be a question that, that we have throughout our government. And there's at least three or four times in which the president has gone has gotten crossways with the law, and the Supreme Court has been called into, into this story. And it's always a challenge of trying to figure out, because like you and me can be arrested, but can the DC police just waltz into the White House and arrest the president? I don't know. I don't know if I'd want that to happen, but can they? If they can, then is that being above the law? In, in just functional aspect. Does that, does that make sense? For Adams, that'd be terrible. If the DC police can't walk in and arrest the president like they can arrest anybody else, that's a problem. Now, he also loves the presidency and thinks it's a vital thing, so it is possible that he might have mediated later. I mean, we all change our opinions at different times as we go along. He doesn't like a democracy because it depends on humans, not on law. Now, this is problematic for some people, so I repeat this multiple times in my classes and in speeches. A democracy is a government in which all the decisions are made by all the people all the time. If it's not one where all of the decisions are, are at least, that all people have affordability to make the decision, they can choose not to, but if that's not the system, that's not a democracy. So we can say we want something else that's not a republic, but let's not call it a democracy, unless we're gonna go down a system where all the people get to vote on all the decisions, I mean all the decisions. The bill's having some minutia debate about a, 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 an amendment to the bill, and then while we get our phones ding, we have to vote on it. And if in your head you go, that'd be miserable, I agree with you, but then you're saying you don't live in a democracy. You live in a democracy, all the decisions are voted on by all the people, all the time. And that's, that's what the Athenians set up. All the citizens. All the citizens, that's a key thing. We talked about that before in this room, right? So for him, that's depending on the humans. And by the way, Madison agrees with him. In Madison's view, democracies are, are impossible because it ends up with majority rule all the time. 
So that's a clue that we're not a democracy because we say openly we don't want majority rule. We'll have two-thirds rule. We'll have a veto in which single person rules. So we set up a system in which we say we, we have nods to democracy. So one person, one vote. Um, and in some of our decisions, maybe in most of our decisions made by Congress or in our local cities and stuff, they are made by majority rule, but not all decisions are made by majority rule. So you can see already from the beginning how they, and the reason Madison would say is because when you leave it to the hands of the people, it's too contentious. And it's always a threat to property. Because then the majority can just decide, well, I want what you have, and you get outvoted, so you lose. There's nobody to appeal. There's no court of law in a democracy. There's no judges. Because you would have no need for judges. Because we voted on it. Uh, you know, everybody wearing blue, you're going to prison. Sorry. That's the way it goes. And, and so, you know, Madison's like, that's not good. And most of us, that's why a lot of people say, I want a democracy, but I don't want that. So they've got some other things in mind. That's a different conversation. So you can see now what he wants to do then, and this is where he gets really unique, and we didn't do this, is the assembly should be split into two parts. And if you say, we have that. Not the way he's thinking. He thinks there should be a body, like to some degree the Roman Senate, in which the rich elite, and he used the word aristocrats, end up. And then there should be a body for everybody else. It'd almost be like, and we don't do this, but it'd almost be like we're going to have a wealth bar for who runs for House of Representatives, and if you make more than $80,000, you can't run. Or today we'd probably say one fifty. dollars If you make personally more than one, if you're worth more than, say, $200,000, you cannot run for the House of Representatives. That's, that'd be Adam's kind of way of thinking about it. If you're at the rich elite, you know, you make north of four hundred. dollars you can run for Senate, but you can't run for the House. Because in his view, you need to have a place for both groups to feel like they've got a voice. Because of his fears, the rich and powerful people can take over. Which one could arguably say has happened in our country. Of course, was that kind of like a parliamentary English? It was, because they're House of Lords, House of Commons. Sure. But unfortunately, not unfortunately, their system, House of Lords does negligibly, they don't do anything. They do vote on things in the current House of Lords, but it's all House Commons. House Commons is where all about there. So they're really a unicameral system, in, in my opinion. A, a political scientist probably would disagree with that, but to me, they're a unicameral system because they they just rule everything through there, and the Lords kind of just say, "Yeah, sure." So they don't need both. Both of them have to agree on legislation, just the House of Commons. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then again, the judiciary. So in essence, you could say John has four parts to his. In this, at least at this point in his life, four parts of the government. Uh, a representative group for the aristocracy, the wealthy elite. A representative group for the lower, regular folks like me and you. Um, an executive and a judiciary. Four parts. But then we see what trying to read through some of his things and how he gets there. A constitution bound on these principles introduces knowledge among the people and inspires them with a conscious dignity which causes good humor, sociability, good manners, and good morals to be general. That elevation of sentiment inspired by such a government makes the common people brave and enterprising. What they're really wrestling with is, what does it mean to say we the people? That's before we write that. What does it mean to say a government of the people? How do we include the people? How much should we include the people? Again, one of the things our founders and Adam to be in this boat, you don't want to be in a democracy because broad swath of the people are far too easily misled. And if you just think about the last 20 years, you're like, oh, that's, that's completely true. And I'm, I'm talking about myself. I'm just, I won't say that's about you. you. Maybe you are piercing and can see through all the, all the haze. Um, but for me, I'm constantly going, oh, is that true? I don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know. You know, it's very, very challenging. And so he's like, yeah, they're, not, they're like, that's not, that's gonna be problematic for us. So it would be a positive thing. Then he gets taken to France. He's there very briefly, doesn't go well. It's the beginning of the evidence that he and Ben Franklin are not gonna be friends. They don't like each other. And uh, basically he comes home. Doesn't really accomplish much in the process. But he gets home at a, at a critical moment because Massachusetts at this point is also in the process of writing and creating their own government. He literally lands, and like the week later, he's greeted by some leaders. They're like, we're so glad you're home. We're writing a constitution. Will you please write it? I mean, there was a committee. The committee had gotten out to a smaller committee. 
And then that committee said, oh, John Adams is in town? John should write it. So he basically writes the Massachusetts Constitution all by himself. Now there's another aspect of what the Massachusetts people do that is just brilliant, and it shows that we did value, and John valued, the common person, in that once they got the draft finished, once they kind of said, okay, we're good with what we see here in the kind of legislative group writing it, they sent it out everywhere, and you, know, you can imagine like a group of lumberjacks sitting around reading the Constitution and making notes about what they're afraid of, or a bunch of lobstermen over on the coast, you know, reading the Constitution, saying what they're unhappy with, some tradesmen sitting in a, in a city like Braintree, reading what they're unhappy with, and then they said, they got thousands of comments back, and then they incorporated those in some changes, and ultimately produced the document. It's just brilliant watching that kind of that mixture kind of thing that John would have valued. And I think I'm correct on this, feel free to Google it and find it if you along. It's still around, it's the oldest consistent principle of constitution, I think, I think in, in all of the uh, world history. It, it's ahead of the US Constitution. Right? We always like, our Constitution is like the longest lasting continuous document with amendments. Yet yeah, Massachusetts is older than that. So it's kind of interesting. So what do you say in there? Right? Um, sorry, sorry. It starts with the preamble. The body politic is formed by a voluntary association of individuals. It is a social compact by which the whole people covenants with each citizen and each citizen with the whole people that all should be governed by certain laws for the common good. Ooh, that's good. He then starts with, unlike our Constitution, a Declaration of Rights. So you can see right out of that, John would have agreed with the Anti-Federalists that, hey, the new Constitution does not have any sort of Declaration of Rights. He wanted a Declaration of Rights. And they mimic the English Bill of Rights as well as just generally things that had developed over this time, so free press, freedom of speech, free elections. And this is an interesting place where you can kind of begin to see some differences between Adams and others, right? These rights begin in saying all men, and he would have meant humans in this work, all men are born free and independent. Now, if you think about it, our declaration start, talks about that free and equal. And this is where he and Jefferson will go to their graves disagree. Because Adams will say there can never be an equality amongst people because each person is uniquely made. And what he's thinking about is like intelligence, wealth, opportunity, verbal ability, math ability. You know, Daniel Boone is a singular person, right? He can do things in the wild that most of us can't do, right? Annie Oakley's got the ability to have the vision acuity that most of us don't have. So we can never be equal to her. To her. So he's arguing for the independence that independent, all, of, all of us can be free or, or born free and independent. He'll lose because one of the complaints or one of the comments back channeling the declaration was that Massachusetts will change it to free and equal. Um, but this, this kind of lays out kind of where is this difference between him and Jefferson, him and the others, that you're going to make an equality claim that you can never deliver on, and then it's going to lead to discontent because people are going to note that they're not equal, say in economic terms or opportunity terms, and they'll be frustrated because they're gonna believe, but doesn't our documentation say that we are or should be equal? Or go, government should be doing something to fix my inequality. And Adam's point is you can't fix that. You can't fix the intelligence people have, the common sense people have, the skills people have, you just can't fix that. And so you're making a promise you can't deliver on. I think he's brilliant in this regard. Um, and this is why I think I get so passionate for words myself and try to do well in at least, if we're gonna have a conversation like as a small group, what are we meaning with this word? How are the four of us defining it? Not that I'm right or you're right, just let's get it on the table what we mean. So we can try to get to some clarity. Um, and when you say something that you, if you say we're a democracy, but we're not voting on all the issues, then a person who feels aggrieved over a decision that doesn't go their way We'll have a right to feel aggrieved that, hey, I was ripped off. Aren't we in a democracy? You have to agree on the definition. Yeah, and that clarity of that's really critical. Governing power for Massachusetts will be split, legislative, executive, judicial. So now he's going to do what he said he would do and place in the power of these things will be placed in separate departments. Again, so it might be government of laws and not of men. 
Um, legislature will be split, again, dividing power. He does not press down the road of what he wrote earlier, that there should be like one group that's only for like a certain wealth component or air stuff. He kind of thought that would happen naturally. In this, he's wrong, or it happened naturally, but it happened everywhere. All the government is largely, it's easier to be elected, as you know, in government if you are personally wealthy or you're picked up by the wealthy to shepherd you in. Right? We all know this. It's very difficult for an average person of moderate to limited wealth to run independently for herself and have a snowball's chance of actually winning. We all know this. And that's a, that's a sadness, I would say. Um, again, back to education. Right? It's, the, it's in the government uh, for Massachusetts, the Constitution. The duty of legislators and magistrates to invest in quote unquote cherish the interests of education. And he says, wisdom and knowledge, as well as virtue, diffuse generally among the body of the people, being necessary for the pr preservation of their rights and liberties. And there, have, there, there aren't lists like this, not in the early days, but if there was a list of which state had invested the most in education, Massachusetts from the very beginning will be up at the top because it's in their state legislature. And it goes back then to Adam's viewpoint of how do we, like where was the flaw with feudal law? Where is the flaw in the Middle Ages? The body of the people, the average people, my people, I'm just peasants from Germany, would have been kept ignorant, were kept ignorant, not allowed the opportunity. And amongst those people, there could be some who are actually quite right and could be a benefit to society were they afforded the opportunity for that education. Kind of there are his own here. Carl, um, just thinking about our constitution, look at the Massachusetts constitution. Presidents are elected, um, representatives of the House are elected, senators are elected. Did the, the uh, Adams or any of the founders give any kind of rationale for why the judiciary was in a lot of places not elected instead of appointed? So talking about the constitution as opposed to Massachusetts, because I'm thinking as you're asking, like, I don't know the answer to that question, which I'm very happy to. I don't know the answer to this. But for our constitution, to remember, we elected only one of the four groups. So this is a clue, I would suggest, how we've ruined our own government. So we did not elect the president. We did not elect the Senate. We did not elect the judiciary. We only elected the House of Representatives, which for Madison and the founders was their one nod to democracy governmentally. And that's why they get put the money for the house. The house is supposed to create the budget. Every time I hear government or the Congress talking about waiting on the president to produce a budget, my head explodes. <laughs> and I'm waiting for a president, we haven't had one in a very long time that I can think of, who will say, that's not my job. I'm not doing it. I will not give you a budget. You guys do it. You're, you represent the people. You're the people's money. Uh, but so we only voted for one. So then the question you really want to ask next is, when did we start changing that? When did we start voting more directly for the president? When did we start voting directly for the senators? And then the second question after that is, did that produce a positive effect? I would argue no, that it didn't produce a positive effect. Um, but that's a political conversation, which I'm more than willing to tell you later. Um, but but so that, but that's the thing. So And I, I wish I knew, Eric, about these guys, that they, how they did voting. Um, I should have looked for that. That's a very good question. Good? Yeah, good. Um, he expresses his strong opinion about the three branches and kind of how he explains it, right? And he says that we shall never have stability, dignity, decision, or liberty without it, it, it being a split government, a mixed government. And when he's saying mixed, he's thinking like a king and aristocrats and common people. This is gonna be where he's really gonna struggle with most Americans, because we're gonna be like, we don't have a king, and we don't wanna have aristocrats. So they're gonna feel like, and they're gonna accuse him of wanting to impose that. There's zero evidence that he ever wanted to impose that. But he's using that as nomenclature to kind of express his view. Probably was unwise to use that nomenclature and not pick up on the fact that those words are no longer the way people are talking. You need to find another way to express what you're trying to get to of a power in a single, a power in a small group of wealthy people, and a power in the body of the total. But he never did, so it's, it isn't hard. Then he goes on and says, we have so many men of wealth, of ambitious spirits, of intrigue, of luxury, and corruption, that incessant factions will disturb our peace without it, again, it being the mixed government. Meaning, a lot of rich people don't take over the government. 
And as we have a way to keep, A, them contained, and opportunity for everybody else. Right? And again, I would just say from my point of view, what he was afraid of actually happened. It hasn't happened recently. It's been a long time. Perhaps arguably from 1810, 1820. So, you know, not anything about us moderns. It's not like our fault, like something we've done. And you don't have to read. So for him, then the executive, which ought to be the reservoir of wisdom, gets back to the electoral college, the last thing you want is the average group of people just randomly saying who do we want to be in charge. You'd rather be thoughtfully thinking who's most skilled, or in his case, most wise to do. She is, get her. But she doesn't want to do it. Too bad, she's got to do it anyway. That's, that's their thought process. But we're not going to make it a popularity contest because popularity contests always go poorly. And again, arguably, I think you can say, yeah, that's been true for our story because we've made the presidency a popularity contest really from Jackson. So early, so it's not a late thing. It got worse or exacerbated with television. So the 60 election, Kennedy Nixon, from then to now, and obviously social media and instantaneousness of, of, uh, of conversation through our technology has made it even worse. But it's totally a popularity contest yeah. rather than some conversation about wisdom we like to pretend that we're talking about it, and our guy, or hopefully one day, our girl, is super wise. But if we're actually, in my opinion, ever really honest, we'd say, yeah, no, no. We didn't pick somebody really wise. We picked somebody who worked the system, and then they're there. That's, that's just me. You don't, don't have to agree. The executive, which ought to be the reservoir of wisdom, as the legislature is of liberty. So what's the legislature do? The legislature is protecting our liberty. The executive is giving us the wisdom. Without this weapon, what's the weapon? The weapon is the three branches of defense. He thinks the executive will be run down like a hare before the hunters. In other words, if the rich elite and the assembly are able to have a, a lot of power. So again, for him, it's mixed. This is another, I think, evidence of where you say we've really gone wrong. Like, could you actually sit here and show me where you know there's a clear demarcation of power in our current branches? And certainly for me, when I think of executive and legislative, it's all blurred now, to me. Where it's just, they're all kind of in, like a group. With this, okay, that, that's not a horrible thing, but it's not been separated. And in his mind, and I'd say when you read the Constitution and early founders' minds, the executive needs to be able to do stuff that, I'll just go ahead and speak it in existence, she can do, and she can do alone. But then there's a ton of stuff she cannot do and should never try to do, should never speak to doing, and vice versa. That the assembly, and then for John, the house, separate from the Senate. The Senate's got things only it can do. Now, again, that's not how we did it. Our, from the beginning, our Congress was wherever the bill came from, there'd be a reconciliation meeting to try to work together, and then it'd produce them from Congress. And he had to live with that. I mean, he was president over that. He didn't try to change it. So either he agreed with it or accepted it, one or the other. But in his mind, early, you'd have stuff that only the Senate does. And they would not have to get anybody's approval in the sense of somebody else voting on it. The president would have to sign off on it because he's that last line of defense against tyranny. So if she needs to veto it, she will. Right? Does that make sense? But there, the House is doing its own thing. And the president or the executive does their own thing. So he feels like there's this problem if you get a message. And he talks about the Massachusetts people, and basically, you know, it's the first people, oh, this is worse, it's the first people who've taken so much time to deliberate upon the government, and they did. A deep deliberation amongst the totality of the citizens, like I said. And seriously, I'm totally serious. Think about it in the backwoods of Massachusetts where you'd have some lumberjacks, people that today people might think of not worthy of of really deep intellectual thought, or, or lobster people, right? Or lobster, sh or whalers, right? Just average ship hands, right? Coming in, you see them coming in one night, and we're having a meeting here at the at the local bar, this room, meeting house, and you got these fishermen coming off the ocean, and they're given this thing to read, and they are reading, and they are thinking, and they are contributing. I, I just, that's beautiful in my mind. Or being read, too. Yeah. So then now, he goes back to France, and he will be there for about a decade, um, working, and I believe he actually, I know this is an insult to Franklin, or a challenge to Franklin, but I, for me, I think of Adams as really our first ambassador. He's really the first one to be thinking about 
what's our role with these other countries, and how should we express? That's a different conversation. But while he's there, he begins to read in European papers challenges to what we're trying to do. Again, you have to remind yourself that what we were doing was singular in, in the history of the world, or at least since the time of the Romans. And you have to remind yourself that from a British point of view, the British was the most liberal government in the world. And they were the most progressive liberal government going. <coughs> So here's this group of people saying that's not good enough in terms of rights and liberties. So that's, that's it. That's it. And so in Europe, people are going, man, what are these people doing? So he writes a defense of the constitutions. Now, what he's talking about are the state constitutions. And it's a very, very long work. And a lot of Adam's writing is really challenging to read because he basically takes some other book that was written in Roman history or somebody else, and then he just copies like pages of it, and then he comments on it, and you know, it's almost like, you know, at least when the Bible gives us Jesus' words in red, I can say, oh, okay, that must be what Jesus supposedly said kind of thing, right? You need it almost like color-coded, because you're reading, and you're thinking, am I reading Adam? Am I reading Cicero? Who am I reading right now? It, he didn't do a good job. He would have been benefited from a really good editor, but he doesn't have it. So he begins writing this. This is like the third big piece. And so he spends considerable time trying to defend this thing we've been talking about. How and what do I mean by this? And as you're rolling into the last decade, you know the French Revolution is about to begin when he's raised. He's not there yet, but it's all, you can already see some things happening. And Jefferson and Adams could sense it. They, they started writing to each other about it. And of course, Jefferson in particular, like, this was great. And Adams was like, mm, I'm not so sure they're ready. It's like they were conversations. But so they're talking about it, and many people by this point were in on the majority needed to be the controlling part, because it sounds good. It sounds right, we, do, we the people of the United States and we're a more perfect union, and as he's writing this, the Constitutional Convention will begin, right? So there, it, it sounds right. Um, and in fact, when you read the preamble and then you read the Constitution, you're kind of like, wait, who wrote this? Because they didn't write this. Because there's very little of we the people in the Constitution, as we described. But the preamble would almost sound like you're leading into a democracy. Great. So he's trying to com com compete with that, combat that. And I already told you this part. So here he's basically laying out that there will be this difference amongst people. And there's never going to be a moment in which you do not have a wealthy elite. And he's right, historically. You, you, in the communist countries, which promised to eliminate all economic inequality, you quickly had a wealthy elite. They weren't just a powerful elite, but equally poor. Like at least, they, at least they didn't have that part of their deal right. They still stayed poor, they just had power and choose to self-moderate. No, they were the wealthy elite. And so Adams is completely right that you can never design a system that doesn't have that issue. So his point is, you will have this issue. You must structure to, to account for the issue and not pretend like they're gonna just be nice together. And so, because you know, the inequity cannot be fixed by law. There's just no way to do it, the way he sees it. And so he talks about this, going every village in New England, you'll find that elected officials are generally descended from generation to generation in three or four families at most. And then if you eliminate all the aristocratic elites, the moment they are dead, another aristocrat group comes up. And again, historically, that is easily proved over and over and over and over and over again. So the solution, he tries to argue, is you've got to limit them to a part of the government. Because, and this is important for him, the rich are citizens too. The rich have a benefit to the country. They provide things for the country. They should be demonized because they're, and if we get away from the rich, the intellectual elite, the, the sharpshooter Andy Oakley, the, 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 the um, searching skills of a Daniel Boone, they should be demonized because they're elite. There is a benefit with their elite to the rest of us. So you need a place for them, and I, back to here he's talking about wealth. 
that they should be included in this process. And so again, the way you ruin this is by a single legislature. This is where he and Jefferson really will get it all with each other. So like the Pennsylvanians, I think they still do, but certainly at that time, their government was a unicameral system. The Articles of Confederation was a unicameral system. It's a single body in the legislature. And he's like, yeah, that's, that's a terrible idea. We need two separate ones, one for the elite, one for the regular folks. Uh, any system that did not have a separate judicial plan, that's also a recipe for disaster. Remember the Articles of Confederation not only did not have an executive, it did not have a separate judiciary. So the idea of a Supreme Court was in Congress. There would be regular courts, but if there's some need under the Articles for a Supreme Court to make some kind of final conclusion, it was to come back to Congress. And there's enough lawyers in there you can figure it out. But John's point is that that's mixing where their power lies. You need it separate to protect it kind of a thing. Which, Eric, is one of the reasons why they believe fiercely in a non-elected judiciary and a lifetime judiciary. That's problematic now that we've lived longer. It could be considered problematic for some people now that we live longer. But in their minds, you'd have somebody as a judge maybe 20 years. And, but that still gives, it's kind of like institutional um, knowledge. You know, when you work in a place for a long time, so those, those employees get institutional knowledge, which is beneficial, can be beneficial to the success going forward. And then, you know, he, he does really lean into Hobbes. So Hobbes' view, if you remember from human nature, is the human is not naturally good and will act in a self-interest, which I find compelling. And so he says this, you know, to expect self-denial from humans when they have a majority in their favor and consequently power to gratify themselves is to disbelieve all history and universal experience. To talk of founding a government upon a supposition that nations and great bodies of people left to themselves who practice a course of self-denial is to babble like an infant or to deceive like an unprincipled imposter. And I think what, what you really get here, remember, this is at the beginnings of what becomes known as the Enlightenment of Age of Reason. And what John is saying is what I, so, oh, this is real provocative, the Enlightenment was not a good thing. It's not the good thing we've been told it was. So John's point is this. If you cast out a vision that cannot be accrued to due to, you know, like the equality of elite, you then are putting people in a place where they will be angry and discontented over being deceived. In other words, they'll get to the point, and they'll go, I don't have what you promised, and then they're angry. But they're angry because they were believing they were going somewhere that from the beginning you could never have promised to be going. That makes sense. I promise your kids you're going to go to Disney and you end up at the park. Well, the park's a wonderful place, but your child will have a reason to be angry at you. You say, what's a park? They want to do the parks. There's, we'll pretend. Look, there's some leaves. We'll make it Mickey, right? You'd be, you'd be a terrible person if you did that, lying to a child like that, right? It is. So he wants to make sure to protect the minority, including the aristocracy, and this, of course, is where, you know, he gets into trouble. And this, we've already kind of already covered this, but the rich are people as well as the poor. They have rights as well as others. And I think sometimes when I hear people talk in our modern day, say the past 25 years, you almost feel like they want to believe that the rich are evil and have no rights themselves. And again, all John's saying, can they do evil? Yeah, can they accumulate power? Absolutely, probably will. So then you need to structure for that, not just rail against them as some horrible, horrible people. He'll spend all of his writing saying this is the threat to good government. This is what causes good government. When, when and I just skipped some slides, I'm sorry, uh, about the French Revolution. For John, the French Revolution became the epitome example of his point about aristocrats, about excess power, about wealth, and that it's kind of a doom to a successful venture in this very challenging thing of civic governance. Right? You don't have to agree with him. He's with Burke. Burke, as you may know, is a critic also in that process. And so he spends so much time, and in his defense of governances, he comes out on this. So he's writing saying democracies are not positive. They're not good. They're troublesome. They're going to mislead people and lead to kind of a blow up. And you don't want that in the system. 
And not surprisingly, that will not read well. It will not play well. It'd be like being in the 1950s saying, you know, communism could be an effective government. You know, it's not gonna play well. And then it's hard enough saying it now, perhaps, but you say in the 1950s, you know, you're in trouble, right? So, but he doesn't care. He's like, nope, I'm gonna go down the road. So let's look at these last four things of how, what are the threats? The warning against luxury. In 1782, let us turn our thoughts to what is future, the union of the state, education of the rising generation, the formation of a national system of economic policy, and, and manners are the great concerns. We must guard as much as prudence will permit against the contagion of European manners and that excessive influx of commerce, luxury, and inhabitants from abroad which will soon embarrass us. Please don't read this as him being anti-immigrant. He's not. What he's saying is that we need to be aware of what's been the doom or the downfall, from Adam's point of view, of many European nations and their, again, good governance, and not their failure as a state and collapse. They don't, England still exists, as we know, right? France still exists. But they don't, from John's point of view, they have bad governance. And why? Well, because when he gets over there in his first trip, and then he sees it even more in his second trip, when Abigail comes over when they're the ambassador to England, she notes it that the level of luxury in those countries was to him excessive and that excessive luxury will always lead to a downfall because it will lead the people away from what's necessary um, from a sense of self-discipline of moderation of hard work because everything's just not easy for them he ties this to pleasure Kings, nobles, and people are alike in this respect, and in general, know no other bounds of indulgence than the capacity of enjoyment and the power to gratify it. So, we ought to find a form of government best calculated to prevent the bad effects and the corruption of luxury. And he talks about how the Romans, and this is absolutely true, the Roman Republic fell due to an excess of luxury. You could arguably say the empire falls for the same reason, different conversation. Um, the disposition to luxury is so strong in all humans and in all nations that it can be restrained where it has the means of gratification only by education, discipline, or law. But for him, education. But to teach people moderation, where he's going to go. Second threat, democracy. And again, I kind of already covered this one, but just to point out. Freedom produces magnanimity and courage. But there is not freedom nor justice in a simple democracy for any but the majority, the ruling party. No doubt will be active and bold, but the rules will be discouraged, browbeaten, and insulted without a possibility of redress but by civil war. It's a mixed government then, well balanced, that makes all the nation of a noble temper. But we can find a place where all aspects of the society can contribute and know that they've got a chance to contribute and then make sure the structure is balanced in some way so that the part where they get to contribute to does not have excess power nor minority power, has a voice that's contributing over some piece of it. That, for Adams, was what was crucial. In 1804, he writes, I love this sentence here, democracy is like the young rake, like in a fictional romance, who thinks himself handsome and well-made, but who had little faith in female virtue, Democracy is the artful villain who will pursue the lovely girl to her ruin and her death. And later he writes to Rush, I cannot help but thinking that democracy is a distemper of the kind, kind of a disease. And when it is once set in motion and obtains a majority, it converts everything good, bad, and indifferent into the dominant epidemic. Again, for him. Now, he only focused so much on democracy, I'll add, because it became the kind of hip thing to talk about. He would have written similarly about monarchy, and when he gets back to America and he's put on verbal trial, he's, he's just, just a, gone after about aristocracy. Right? He defend, you see writings, so he would have said aristocracy is a threat also. So he's not in favor of any of these. You may know when he was the first vice president, and so he takes his speech, at that time, the vice president was supposed to sit actively in the, in the Senate. They eventually get the Senate pro temp and they get somebody who kind of takes it so the vice president can go do whatever they wish to do and not be there unless there's a tie-breaking vote needed. Um, and so the first thing they talked about was what do we call a president? And John was thinking we need a name or a title of some dignity. 
and he went with the current titles of the time, which was an excessively long, you know, monarchical laden term, you know, his royal, you know, his excellence and all this kind of stuff. And he gets beat down for it, and rightfully so. The president fits who we are as a title. Um, but his point was to say after that, I was like, look, I'm not supporting monarchy. I just think the executive needs to be respected. And he always thought the executive, at least when he was the president or early, was going to have less power than the, 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 Constitu the Congress. Now, when Jackson gets into office, he would have changed, he changes his mind. Third thing, power. Liberty to every conceivable form of government is always in danger. Ambition is one of the most ungovernable passions in the human heart. The love of power is insatiable and uncontrollable. That was in his oration of government. So the idea, Lord Acton said it more familiar, that we all know power corrupts. Absolute power corrupts absolutely. I'm sure if every one of you have worked, you've been in some kind of a group, or you've even been in a classroom, or a school club. Somebody gets in charge, and that power becomes something that, in essence, begins to corrupt and lead them to a place where they like being in power, they want to keep being in power, and they enjoy the, the trappings that come with being in power. Um, so, you know, he's saying this is not, this is not good. It's very intoxicating. Um, he actually thought we will, we basically will never avoid this. We will, this will be what kind of takes us down the hill. We will go down here. And he was, as I mentioned, a fierce, fierce critic of the French Revolution. And he thought it was basically um, an explosion of passions that could not be governed, and by no fault of their own, the French people were in no position to write an effective government. And evidence bears it out. I mean, since the French Revolution, I think they're on like their 15th or 16th constitution. They went through three monarchies, three, two empires, you know, a bunch of republics, and they're all over the place, kind of back and forth. His point is that's not because something wrong with them as a people, but because they didn't have the training educationally to see good governance. There's one quote where he said, basically, we could have gone and just pulled five people out of the backwoods of Massachusetts and produced a better constitution than the French did. And then he really got frustrated at one point saying, don't call this the age of reason. Call it the age of frivolity. Meaning, when you look at the French expression, and again, I studied the French Revolution, where my master's degree was kind of focused on, so I understand what the other side would say to him or to Burke, but I feel like the evidence is on their side, Burke's and, and Adams, that what you see is a lot of excess, a lot of violence, a lot of turmoil, and for John, that's evidence of both the power of democracy, or putting hand power in, in the people broadly, but also the power of the issue, the threat of power, what it does to us uh, in that. So the war that is breaking out will render our country, whether she is forced into it or not, rich, great, and powerful in comparison to what she now is, and riches and grandeur and power by the same effect upon American as it had upon European mind. I would suggest to him that that doesn't happen until 1945, um, but since 1945, he's been absolutely correct. And then the last one, virtue and morality. Um, he was a, an active Christian, um, was not what we would call today an evangelical, pretty moderate in his expression. But so for him, virtue is a, a key component to pulling off what has happened. And the warning for us is that we would lose our republic um, if we didn't have this. And to be clear, he was worried about it at the moment. So here, right, he's saying now there's so much rascality, so much venality and corruption, so much avarice and ambition, such a rage for profit and commerce. He's not talking about you and me. He's talking about back then, right? So he was concerned about that then. Um, the principles of a good form of government are as easily destroyed as human nature is corrupted. Such a government is only to be supported by pure religion or austere morals. Public virtue cannot exist in a nation without private virtue, and public virtue is the only foundation of republics. If you don't have virtue, and what he's kind of alluding to, and way to say it is back to the wealth thing, right? What is the counterbalance for me acquiring great wealth for myself? Why should I not be able to? You can't tell me I can't. But if I have a self-moderation that many religions teach and a willingness to see my fellow man, which many religions teach, and some, some you know, philosophical teachings get to, then though I've gained great wealth, I will use very little of it for myself and I will give it to my fellow man. But that's not my natural state. My natural state is, as Hobbes suggests, to acquire for myself and for my posterity. 
right? And that's not, I won't even say that's evil. That's my natural state. And so you need something that can counterbalance that from my natural state. And for John, and I happen to agree with him, uh, austere morals, some kind of a religious teaching, some kind of foundation that, that says this is a good to be self-moderate. And those of you who lived through the 90s and 1990s like I do, know that was never what we were told, right? The 1990s, you remember that, right? So take, 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 take. And that may have been true for a longer time, but just in recent, recent history. Uh, thoughts on governance, the preservation of liberty depends upon the intellectual and moral character of the people. As long as knowledge and virtue are diffused generally among the body of a nation, it's impossible they can be enslaved. Um, moral character of your people, of our people, is infinitely greater worth than all this. So this he was writing about the fact that we already owed money to Europe. And he was like, we need to pay it back. Instead of saying that we shouldn't pay it back. It was a moral aspect to pay back debts you have taken out. <coughs> Here. Uh, based on that, Carl, was there any discussion by Adams or some of the other founders uh, uh, to kind of help bring that uh, moral character along by incorporating any, like, uh, canon law or theocracy within the government? No. And, in fact, he's asked about that when he's the president. And he was like, no, 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 and I don't even like to talk about religion, he said in this letter, as a part of governance. Um, it should be individual. But it should be... Um, like a champion, that virtue is a, is a good and virtue is connected. So you can't just say be virtuous. Oh, I'm sorry, self responsibility. Yeah, but you've got to then have something that then is incorporated in. And that's why he all, almost always links virtue and education. He ties them together. Now, coming from Massachusetts, we might say, ah, oh, but that was probably there were religious schools, and he might have had maybe even more of a blended thing in his subconscious. That'd be fair. Um, but he doesn't try to impose any of that anywhere when he was the vice president or president to suggest that. He, he thinks that there can be this thing done, and he would have supported and did support, you know, sort of a, the free expression of religion, and would have been, it didn't happen to say, were someone to have a, an overtly aggressive stance against religions, plural, it's not just Christian, he would have not liked that. He would have, he would have defended the, the, the faith for the necessity of the republic, not so you go to heaven. He's not thinking in those terms. Again, not really even evangelical. He's not thinking like, you should be a Christian because it's good for you. You avoid hell. That's not in his mindset at all. It's like, what will afford good governance? And we have to, because you're going to ask, think about how law works. As we mentioned earlier with the president, law work. We all stop at stop signs at 2 a.m. Why? In a cop around. Some of us do a slow roll, but most of us are still paying attention enough, and we still basically choose to stop. Because something's embedded in us that it's a it's a it's a civic greater good for all the other reasons we can think of that just running it's of no good, right? And so when that's lost, it leads to a weakening of the civic structure. Because then, if you and I agree on a contract to do something, how can I ever believe you'll actually do your part? Just to become a moral fiber. Yeah, there's a moral fiber to the people. Absolutely. Um, so just this idea of wealth and power and passions is really just fine. We're almost done, I promise. Um, and so he just feels like there's a problem. It's going to be very, very difficult. And basically, when the country, this was, I, I like this because of where we are today. When the country gets there, then we are really as a body in a state of drunkenness. They neither act nor think like people in sound health or in possession of their senses. <laughs> now, I'm one of the people, right? So I can't go, you guys. I have to think, wow, man. Ooh. So it's a, when I read this stuff, it's always very challenging to me. Because um, we don't want, you know, when we get this, we will have general delirium and intoxication. If you've ever been drunk, I haven't, but some of you may have. You may have stories about your life that your friends tell you that you acted poorly. Right? When we do that nationally, that ought to be a warning. Right? That ought to be something that we go, hang on. However, I want to come back to this. He's like, look, education can help us. And it's a very long quote, so I won't read the whole thing to you. But you can read it for yourself. But he's writing it towards the end of his life, 1850. We have to have education. We have to have education. Education is the knowledge upon the whole promotes virtue and happiness. Um, so you really can focus on this. We have a chance, every human being, man, woman, child, right? And, but he notes, even with education, 
it's going to be a long fight for virtue. And you got to be willing to go have that struggle, right? You got to be willing to stand into that struggle because just on knowledge alone or even an agreement casually that yes, we should be virtuous will not lead us to virtue, will not lead us to good governance. You got to be willing to, to kind of go in the struggle for key principles that will produce or you believe will produce good governance. Remember that phrase, yeah, which is not unique to him, for the common good, right? For all people to experience a, a common good. And I think that's where we'll stop. There was one more slide, but you'll stop right here. This is the positive one. As always, thank you. Does anybody have any questions you want to ask now? You may ask a question. Yes, ma'am? Um, I hear what he's saying, but is his desire to have groups like an aristocracy, does he not think that this would have happened in that group? Coming from that group? Does he, that does he not have, think they that they would have luxury, that they would have more wealth, that they would have. Amongst the aristocracy, yeah, so much for the aristocracy yeah. to be acknowledged as a group that is there. That we're stuck with. Does he think that things like this, like the desire for power over others and, and luxury and all this, wouldn't happen from that aristocracy group? So he, he does think. So she's asking, does does Adams not see the concern that being given a place in the governance? that they will pursue even more wealth. He does think that they will. And again, his defense to it is that they are only limited to this one area. This one, so it's not this clean, but if you and I could divide our government and decisions in government in quadrants, it'd be like this fourth of the government, this, yeah. these decisions are yours as rich elite. You have no say so over the rest. Now, I don't think that's practical. I don't think that's how practical governments work. So I would disagree with him. I'd say philosophically, I get what you're going. Yeah. But practically, I'm not sure it would work. And why you think it would always work. be with the thing? Well, I think, yeah, there's lots of reasons why I think it would be problematic in decision making. But that's his view, that they will run amok. So it's not if they will, they will. Okay. And so the only way to stop them is to say, this is the limit of your power here. And you can't go beyond it. Again, we could say wishful thinking, and we could accuse him of saying, again, like he said, you've got to work it out. They see it go over years, and we could say, dude, that's, that's not going to work. Because historically, I would argue, wealth has a way to control everything. And, and that's just the way it's always worked out. So I think his provision, while laudable, I don't think it would work in the real world of active humans. And I think, quite honestly, he saw that. Because for Jefferson to be lauded as this common man, average Joe, defender of rights, when he was he was one of the most egregious elitists in the country. And for the people not to see it, I think he knew. It's still going to be a struggle. I mean, his, his calling out to the rascality, right? To, to the, that there's a lot of people already kind of lurching for power, and I'm frustrated, I'm worried about the country. In 1780, right, or even in seven, before we even got the Constitution, I'm worried about the country being able to do this thing. I mean, I think, I think he knew, at least he knew by experience by the 1820s that it didn't go the way he wanted because again, wealth has that ability, power has the ability, which often is tied to wealth, has that ability to allow the person with the power to then act in the way that she wishes beyond whatever may be the ascribed bounds for her. Yeah. Other questions? Thank you guys so much. Thank you. Thank you.